Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I'm Mary and I'm one of your facilitators. Um, and we would love for y'all to engage in the chat a little bit with each other because there's a lot of you. So if you could share where you're logging in from and include the indigenous land if you know it. I'm on Creek, Cherokee, and Muskogee land. And if you are like, I have no idea what that is, there's a link where you can click on that and put where in the world you are and it will tell you. Share your pronouns, um, just in case somebody doesn't know how to pronounce your name. Um, what brought you to this workshop? Why are you here? And um, if you're here as an organization or as a DEI consultant, that just helps us get to know y'all a little bit more. This will also be live broadcast to YouTube as well. Um, and we will make another mention of that before that happens. We have some summit volunteers also in the room as well. So if you'll have any questions about that, please do um, find us. I think we, the summit volunteers are summit in name and I'm gonna invite them to also put an asterisk. So we are at the top of your screen. So whenever y'all are gonna start broadcasting to YouTube, I invite the volunteers should just give folks a heads up on that. The chat won't be shared on the live broadcast at all. It's just for this space. So again, welcome again, folks. We're just encouraging y'all and inviting you to connect with each other on chat. We also know that y'all are semi-forced to be off camera and coming into this space. So we'd love to see you as well for those who can see. So we encourage you to share your video with us as well. Uh, Crystal, I'm from Jenner, California. It's amazing to have someone from Fort Bragg. I just wanted to say hello. Yeah, Liz is also co-facilitating this workshop with me. She's not just a voice in the space. Um, so thanks, Liz, for being here. So again, welcome, folks. I think folks are steadily coming in. We encourage y'all to be on camera just for this introductory part so we can have y'all connect with each other for those that can see and for those that are able to also write in the chat and see the chat. Um, we're just sharing a little bit about yourself. So welcome to this workshop. If y'all could just share a little bit more about where in the world you are logging in from, what brought you here, and if you're here as an organization or as a DEI consultant. All right, so I'm also seeing as well for our tech folks in the room, um, folks can't unmute themselves yet. Um, so I believe folks can take themselves off video. Um, so if we could allow folks to unmute just before we go live, just to give different voices some space, because right now it's just my voice <laughs> and Liz's voice. So we'd love to just hear from folks. Thank you for joining us for this second block. Um, and also as transparency, um, this session is supposed to be live streamed to YouTube. And what's happening in the background is we're trying to figure out how to make that happen. But we will, Liz and I will start on time, whether it's on YouTube or not, because we have a lot to cover today. So thanks for being here, everyone.
Hi, Mary and Liz, this is Bonnie in Texas Port. I'm understanding that we don't go live to YouTube for concurrent sessions, but that the sessions that have been have recording permission like ours will be posted on a later date. Great, thank you for that, Bonnie. Sure. Liz, were you gonna jump in? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say hello, everybody. I know Mary's been talking. Um, I'm really excited to get to work with you for the next um, almost 90 minutes, 85 minutes now, and we'll do more formal introductions in a little bit. Um, but thank you all for being here on this beautiful Saturday, beautiful gray Saturday here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, so in a, we're just going to hold space maybe for another minute. Um, don't feel like once we begin with other parts of our workshop um, that y'all are still encouraged to introduce yourselves off to the side to the chat. But Liz, if you want to bring up the first slide, that would be fantastic. The next one. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, we have a pretty high capacity for this workshop because um, so folks will probably come in throughout. So you might hear us introduce some bits again and repeat some bits. So appreciate y'all for being here on time. Again, my name is Mary and I'm on Creek, Cherokee and Muscogee land. And the facilitation of this work, the creation of this work is on the indigenous land of the ancestral homelands of Creek, Cherokee, Muscogee, Osagi, and Sha Wandese Chula peoples. <clears throat> and we want to share that and be transparent in that because um, land acknowledgement, it can be very easy to say, great, this is the land we're on, let's move forward with our workshop. And instead we want to be intentional about offering resources and ways for folks to connect with indigenous peoples. You're encouraged to do that. You're encouraged to identify and find your indigenous land. And with that also support initiatives that are focused on returning land. And you can read more about that at nativegov.org. Thank you, Mary. Um, so uh, a little bit of intro to this workshop. Um, I just wanna, we wanna be transparent um about how this is going to work today we are recording um and we also realize that we are we're going to be asking you to share experiences from your organization from doing dei works and trying to create sustainable change in your organization and so um sometimes that can be tricky right if you if you know that there's going to be a recording that's put out there for the public i believe that we have set it up so that the recording will not capture names um if we could i i think that if we could just get a confirmation maybe in the chat that that is what the setup is going to be that would be beautiful um and um interaction is going to look like I'll, we'll be totally up front. Mary and I usually do very interactive workshops. This is a larger group over Zoom, so it won't be as interactive as we would have preferred, but there will be a lot of opportunities for people to share in the chat, to raise their hands using the raise hands function, um, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom. And uh, we'd love to bring your voices into the space, uh, either through text or through audio. Um, I uh, just want to refer folks to the code of conduct of the summit and really give a big shout out to our volunteers, Bonnie and Josh, who have set up all of our technical needs and been doing a lot of back and forth with us all week. Um, we're really grateful for the time and energy that they've uh, offered to us um, during this time. So thank you, Josh and Bonnie. You can't see them, um, but they're there in the background. Um, yay. Yeah, thank you for that. I also want to highlight as well that we will have a slide show up the entire time. I'm sure for some of y'all that might be that might bring on some groans and we recognize that um, one of the intentional reasons to do that, especially for this particular workshop is uh, Google Slides offers closed captioning. So for those that might have access needs around that, that's also a benefit of having a slide show up consistently is because it allows different folks to be able to meet their access needs as well. So I just want to draw attention to that. And that's coming through at the very bottom of the slide for those who can see. Are you going to add something, Liz? No, thank you for mentioning that. 
Yeah, of course. So I'm Mary again, uh, Liz has just spoken. Um, and what we just want to share a little bit about what brought us to this work, right? Because this is a very intentional workshop that has come out of conversations that Liz and I have both had with each other, both separately in doing diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting, and work that we have done together around diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting. And what we have found is a result of this workshop, and we want it to be transparent in offering that work. And that's what brings me to this work in particular. It can take a lot of time and can sometimes feel like a lot of wasted energy when organizations don't know what they want. And that's both missed opportunities as a consultant and missed opportunities as an organization to actually get at the heart of what you need. So that's what specifically brought me to this particular workshop. Um, and in terms of what brings me to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion work is as a person of color, I think that until folks actually learn to see each other as humans, there will unfortunately always be a need for this work. And one day I hope to no longer have to consult around diversity, equity, and inclusion because people can feel safe and comfortable to show up fully without um, dire repercussions in doing that. Thank you, Mary. Um, so my name is Liz Foster Shaner. I uh, run a collective called Theater of the Oppressed Pittsburgh and I'm also a consultant with Inclusant. Um, I have come to this workshop with Mary through a lot of conversations that we've been having leading up to this time, um, mostly around some of the, um, for me, the questioning of what, what is the impact of this work with DEI consulting? What impact are we really having? And I think especially for me as a white woman, um, am I just profiting off of DEI consulting work or am I creating sustainable, lasting change that is going to make a difference? So really thinking about my role um, and my identity categories around that. Um, I do a lot of work, uh, interactive work around um, identity, social and personal identity, um, and uh, I'm really trying to think about, you know, how we can bring people's full identities into their organizations, into their work with community, into their relationships with each other, at the same time that we're also keeping an eye on the systems um, that are in place that are preventing folks from doing that. So the interpersonal and the systemic. Um, we also want to acknowledge and appreciate other people who have helped us develop this workshop. Um, as we've been coming up with our framework, we've been sharing it with other folks in our community um, and trying to get feedback, people who do this work, people who do this work directly or peripherally. Um, and so these are just some of the names uh, that we wanted to bring into this space. These folks do amazing work. Um, please reach out to them if, or, or Google them if you want to know more about what they do. Um, and uh, they've, they've provided some great insights into what we're going to share, either both informally and formally over the last several months. So, um, this is still me, yes? Yes. So, uh, before we really launch in, we're talking about uh, sustainable change. We're talking about change related to diversity and equity and inclusion within organizations. And we've got a lot of thoughts about this that we are going to share with you. Um, but we also wanted to ask you before we begin, what does, what does organizational change look like or mean to you to bring your voices into the space. So take a moment to uh, come up with your thoughts around organizational change. It could be a really specific practice. It could be an interaction. It could be big systemic cultural changes. Um, but what does organizational change look like or mean to you related to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And if anyone wants to share verbally, go ahead and raise your hand. We can bring your voice into the space as well. So I'm also seeing now in the chat, and Liz, we can just bounce off each other with sharing some of these things in the chat. Apologies if we don't get to everyone. We're just bringing some voice into the room um, in terms of 
a response to this question, change in administration, giving up power. Thank you for that, Dana. Um, touched on, uh, I realized that I just said a name, so I'm gonna stop doing that and just say the content um, as well. Um, so it's not, yeah. So it's not included on the recording. So thanks for that. Um, rethinking our organizations at every level, giving the organization the tools to raise awareness, transformation of relationships, culture and policy change using the antidotes of white supremacy culture, culture change that impacts everything, relationship policies, how we do things. And then there's some other things as well, Liz, if you wanna share out. Mm -hmm. um, centering people who are previ previously marginalized uh, so that work is enriched and improved. So bringing in additional voices. I see a lot about making it a big, a, a part of the way that the system operates uh, daily and intentionally. Um, redefining cultural norms and executive presence to decenter white supremacy. Bringing the world more alive, building capacity to become more embodied and honest, more seeing each other, more wanting to listen and play and covering me up and make worlds that work for all change that touches comes from the roots transforming the arg is tangled with personal transformation yeah right so it's inseparable from uh what what it change looks like for me uh is also change for the organization so that there's multi multiple levels of change mm -hmm. that's how i interpret that yeah and there's a lot of y'all so apologies for not being able to cover everyone's offer so thank you for that and please do continue to read what folks are writing in the chat liz do you want to talk more about this how this work and this cycle for us yes so go ahead and please keep putting your uh these will be recorded and we also will love to go back and look at the chat um to to see to see your offerings. Um, so for us, we've started to talk about organizational change that is sustainable, that it has a legacy and impact, um, that is effective, that is actually change that is working, right? That, that makes a difference, that is just, and not just in terms of the criminal justice system, right? Which is not always what I would think of as just, but that is um, fair and equitable and ethical, that keeps people people's um, that, that keeps in mind, for me, ethics means, um, am I causing harm, right? And I think about this a lot as a white person doing this work that sometimes in doing this work, although my intentions could be uh, very positive and, and righteous, um, the body that I am in could cause, it could be causing harm in a way that I have not considered. So that's, that's one way to think for me about ethics, but but what is, are we causing harm? What does harm look like? Um, as we've been talking with each other about organizational change and bringing in our experiences and consulting with organizations and talking with organizations, it's really become clear that whatever change means to an organization, it has to be ongoing. Uh, it has to be complex. Um, and we've started to think of it as an ecosystem. So rather than one intervention that happens on a day, right? And I don't know about you, but I've definitely been in those in those train those day long trainings of diver diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, where it's like, okay, this is our day, right? This is our day to do DEI check box done, and then nothing happens afterwards. Um, we're thinking of change as a living, breathing ecosystem that is interrelated, that is dynamic, that is complex, where a change that you make on one level impacts uh, other changes that you make uh, in different parts of the organization. Um, and so for us, it's about um, really committing long term to enacting practices rather than to say, listen, we've all, we're all available on this one day, so this is going to be our DEI day. And we'll talk more about that as we go forward. If we had more time, we'd love to break down what just what sustainable, effective, just, and ethical means to you all, but hopefully we've offered some of our own um, uh, ideas. 
Alrighty. So before we talk about this particular life cycle, there have been a couple of things that have come up. Um, one, in terms of logistics of name sharing, the Pittsburgh Racial Justice Summit is going to record as uh, things can be seen for those that are able to see. So if you're on video and you don't want to be on a recording on YouTube, you're invited to turn your camera off. Um, that also means in terms of names with what we spoke about earlier, there's a miss. Uh, step on our part because we thought we would be able to hide the names and that's not possible. So we just want to circle back to that and let y'all know um, that if you want to turn off your camera, please do. And if you want to change your name as well, you are invited to do that as well. Um, the way that you can change your name is just going up to those three dots on your individual box. And there is an option that says rename, and that's how you can rename. You can put a dot, you can put a slash, you can put a number. Please don't put anything offensive or we will have to invite you to leave. So just wanna mention that. There's also a question about sharing the slides. Here's the thing, it's gonna be on YouTube. So you can go back and watch this again at your own leisure. Um, so just know that it is being recorded in that sense and we will not be sending out a copy of the slides. Alrighty, so I think that those are the logistical things. So thank you for those questions um, and apologies for that oversight logisticalness with the video earlier. Here's why we're here. The rest of the time, Liz and I are going to talk about this DEI life cycle. It's something that we came up with uh, ourselves and also with the support and advice of our advisors that we mentioned before. And this is a framework for how we want to talk through sustainable change in organizations. All of this comes from our own lived experience of having done DEI consulting work um, over the years. So what's going to happen in this particular session is we're going to unpack each phase, which I will read out in a moment, and then we will share the different offerings in those phases. We'll talk about a case study, and we'll talk about the value add for each of those, and the way that you'll be able to interact. So don't think like, cool, y'all are just going to talk at me for the next hour so I can relax. Um, what's going to happen is we're going to give you the opportunity throughout to ask questions and share your thoughts and experiences and feedback in the chat and also using the raise hands feature. Thanks for that, Liz. Can you go back to the life cycle slide and I'll walk through those. Oh, thank you. So the first one, so we're starting at the, for those that can see in the middle portion, um, choosing your plan. <clears throat> Before you even start any DEI work, we think it's important that you figure out what kind of plant are you trying to seed? What, are, what do you actually want um, at its core basic goals, purpose? What outcomes do you want? That type of thing. Um, we'll go into more detail about this, but if you think of it simply, define and assess. Define what you want and then assess what those needs are. Moving into a literal plant cycle, once you've picked out those seeds in that plant, you need to plant them. <clears throat> Planning for us is defined as educate and communicate. So training, different things like that, which we'll go into more detail about. The third phase of this life cycle, you've planted your seed, you gotta take care of it. So you have to water and you have to maintain it. So watering and maintenance. What are you doing to continue to develop and support off of that educate and communicate piece? The fourth part of this life cycle, harvest. So your plant has started to sprout, right? It's starting to have leaves. It might even have fruit or a vegetable on it. So you're harvesting that learning, reflecting and reckoning with what happened. Are there things that are still unsaid or things that you still need to address within your organization and reckon with those things and reflect back on the work that you've already done? And lastly, it's not like, great, we've got fruit, we've got vegetables, we have plant life, we're good. No, you're not good. You need to reseed in order to create a sustainable change. Because you can do all of that work, but if you're not continuing to reinvest and reseed, it takes away the sustainability. Alrighty. So 
we're going to move forward to the next slide. And just before you jump in, Liz, I'm seeing that, um, yes, it's possible that the video might not have folks' names. So thanks um, for that comment in the chat. Just making note of that. Yes, thank you all for your work on figure, helping us figure that out. So I just wanted to like look at this slide. This problem, this might make it seem really simple, right? We're thinking of this as a cycle. It's often messier than that, right? So you might be doing one thing and monitoring maintenance at the same time that you're harvesting somewhere else. You might be planting seeds in one in one season at the same time that you're. Um, uh, continuing to maintain, right? So if we, we're thinking about, we could think about one plant or we could think about a garden. And some of that might depend on the size of your organization. Some of it might de depend um, on the resources that you have available. But um, the, the, the important point is that it's ongoing, right? It's never ending. Um, Absolutely. And Phil is offering, I noticed that outreach is not in the life cycle chart we just talked about, or is that communicate? Um, that's a great point. And, and please hold that in your mind, because when we go through each stage, um, we'd love to have your continuous feedback and thinking about what are we missing or what else might go in this, in this part. Um, all right, so Coming up to choosing your plant, so defining your goals, assessing where you're at. We also wanted to think about that this is, you know, your, the climate that you're in could have an impact on the type of plant that you, that you um, want to grow. Um, the season that you're in, what's happening in the world, right? What's happening in your community? So, so taking into consideration all of these different factors. Um, some offerings of what might happen during this stage. We do not believe that this is absolutely complete, so, right? So when we say these offerings, these are just some of the steps that, that you might think about including. Doing a values clarification, who are we? Prioritizing your needs. Um, assessing the climate of your organization. So how are folks feeling about the organization? Do folks feel included? Do folks feel excluded? What's the history of the organization that's bringing you to this point? really reckoning with the resources that you have, the time, the money, the capacity, the will. Um, I've been talking to some academic departments recently where they want to come in, they want to do a, a day of trainings, and I'm like, okay, do you have the resources to sustain this effort after we're gone? Because if you don't, you might end up causing more harm when folks realize that that's all there was, right? So really think about, is this the time that you're ready to start this initiative? Not that there's, not, not that there's nothing you can be doing at this time, but um, you know, thinking about just how you're gonna start and how you're going to back up and sustain it after, after that day of training. Um, how you're going to engage leadership. And all of the research says that you need to engage leadership directly um, and continuously in this process so that they have ownership as much as everybody else in the organization. So, yeah. Mayor, you're muted. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for that. So basically the way that we've broken this out, this formula that you're seeing in front of you of offerings, case study and purpose is going to be replicated for each phase. So Liz has already talked about the offerings that can come up in a phase like this, and it's not an exhaustive list, right? So if you're like, actually, I did this in my organization, or actually, I do this as a consultant, please do feel free to put that in the chat. You're encouraged and invited to do that. So now when we think about moving to case study, this is an actual client that I had previously, just to show you how these offerings have shown up. So define and assess, this is picking um, that seed, right? Deciding what you actually want to plant. So as a consultant, it's a client meeting to assess the goals. What do you want to do? What does that look like? How long is this gonna be? Um, thinking about, um, what might be some of the outcomes that you want to have. Getting all of that out there helps to create a better foundation to lay the groundwork to understand what 
you're actually working towards in the next phases. It can look at things like a pre-survey for staff, a pre-survey for board of directors if your organization has one. And in this particular case, it was working with a neighborhood organization. So we also surveyed the residents. So all of those different stakeholders, all of those different um, populations of folks are important to understanding and defining and assessing what you actually need to do. What is the problem, so to speak? What, are, what is the thing that you're responding to? Lastly, being able to then take all of that information and use that to inform and define values through coaching. So if you know that, hey, we don't have a specific value related to DEI, being able to um, completely uh, assess so it doesn't just have to come from you as the staff that's at that organization, but it can be informed by the other people that you also serve and work with. And we have a question from Dana who does the defining part of the cycle. And I'm wondering if folks want to respond to that in chat, um, that who might be uh, part of this initial step if I'm reading your uh, question, uh, interpreting your question right, Dana. And also realizing that I'm saying names. Yeah, it's a, this is part of, yeah, Liz and I typically try and be inclusive and in saying the name, so apologies for that. Um, also, it would help us and I think best serve y'all if you do have a question, if you could just write question in capitalization, because we love the comments and we don't want to feel like we might have missed something. So while folks are thinking of that, I have a response to that, Liz, unless you have one. Great. Go for it. So the defining, I think it can, it, that that's part of what that client meeting is for, right? So it's like how much input do you want from me as a consultant? How much um, authority and autonomy do I have? How collaboratively do we want to work together? Do you want me on retainer so that your staff and your board and your residents have access to me and that I'm not just doing things behind the scenes? Or would you rather me be behind the scenes and not have anybody know about anything that you're doing until the very end of this? So I think it it's both a yes and. It's deciding and defining that with the organization and also asking them what they want. Because some folks just want a consultant to come in and be like, all right, this is what you need, bye. Other folks like to be a little bit more hands-on. And the research that I've done points to the more people that you have involved in that defining stage, uh, the more engaged folks are, right? The more ownership there is across different levels of hierarchy and, and departments and whatnot. So I think we have a question. We're curious to know for folks for whom this is relevant, um, what have you done or plan to do in this phase? What offerings do you have? If you're in this phase, if this, if, um, if you've already done this phase or you're currently in this phase, what are some of the what are some of the action steps that you've taken? Also knowing that it's possible that some of y'all in here have never done this before. And that's totally fine. Also recognizing that some of y'all might be like, you know what, we hire somebody every year and this is a refresher for you. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are is exactly where you need to be in responding and engaging in these questions. And also know that these questions are intended to have it be a little bit more interactive for y'all to both hear what Liz and I have to say and also hear from this collective group of folks gathered in here what you also think. Mm -hmm. So I see a couple of folks have created an uh, interested subgroup. So I, I'm guessing this is people who are already engaged in the process, who are already committed or interested in, in making this change. And so maybe getting them on board to keep the energy going um, is a great idea. Um, multiple meetings, trainings, workshops. First one or two part as part of this stage to really gauge where the whole group is at. So yeah, really figuring out, bringing people together in conversation and thinking and questioning. 
uh, focus from moving from a focus of diversity to inclusion, right? That's an important breakout, right? If diversity is who's in the room, inclusion is do they feel like they're even a part of the room, right? Do they even feel welcome in that space? Yeah, so Liz, I'm gonna jump in for time because we have four other phases to get through. If you, Before we go to the next one, do you mind just going back a couple slides because there was a question from someone about could you list the phases again? Yes. So choosing your plant, that's what we just talked about, defining and assessing, planting seeds, educate and communicate, watering and maintenance, develop and support, harvesting of reflect and reckon, and reseed to sustain. So again, if you're like, oh, I want the in-depth version of this because y'all are moving too quickly, you can also talk with us about um, presenting this within your organization as well. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on to the second phase. All right. All right. So second phase is planting seeds, um, planting seeds of ideas, planting seeds of action, educating, getting folks all on the same page about educating, but also communicating intentions. And this, I think, is where outreach definitely comes to play. I, I think of that as part of communicating. So clearly communicating your findings from the first phase and your intentions. A lot of times uh, organizations do climate assessments, but they hold the findings close, right? Maybe they're afraid that the findings are going to make them look bad, right? I think it's important that everybody be on the same page about where we're starting from, right? Because folks know, right? They know if they feel included or not. And so being upfront of like, this is who we are. Um, is uh, with everybody, I think, is an import important step. Um, training, starting with leadership, making sure that leadership is on board from the beginning and has all of the essential training, and then bring in other stakeholders, so staff, board members, uh, any community orgs that you partner with, et cetera, and thinking about fostering in an I ideal environment. So maybe it's about uh, education and making sure people have a, a framework for thinking about oppression and diversity, inclusion, et cetera, but also that uh, there's community building in that training as well, and people are starting to take creative risks and getting to know each other in new ways. Yeah, so what does this look like? So with that same organization, they've moved from that first phase to the second one. I often encourage beta testing sometimes, uh, especially with staff. If you know that you're going to have to do a couple of different trainings to different groups of people, beta test it with the staff, and then you could apply those lessons learned to training with the board. Um, also thinking about collaborative training with similar community groups. Are you finding that you work at an organization and you're like, you know what, just across the bridge or down the way, there's three other organizations that are doing similar work to ours perhaps combining these trainings. So again, it becomes less of just you singularly as an organization doing this work and it becomes more collective. And one of the benefits of that is once that consultant leaves, you now are starting to create a network of other peers that you can bounce those ideas off of and reflect back to those shared experiences. Um, and lastly, with this particular client, um, doing implicit bias training and partnership with the police publicly for the community. So again, if you can go back to the next slide, but the one before it, um, and thinking about defining. So you already talk to staff, you talk to board, and you talk to those residents, and then go to the next slide. So because you've talked to those specific populations, you're also educating those specific populations. It's not like, hey, I serve you, let me suck all this information out of you and you get nothing. No, think about how you can, what can you offer back in terms of education to the folks that you're serving, in terms of the folks that you're also, the whole purpose of your organization. How can you bring them in as part of this process? So the purpose of this phase is to build a foundation of knowledge and a shared language for future collaboration. Because at the end of the day, if you're getting your entire organization to go through training, you're creating a base point for them to refer back to. And remaining transparent throughout that process in order to hold leadership and others accountable for change. So if it's clear that like, hey, it's not just this small department that's doing this work, but instead it's actually the people at the top, so to speak, that inherently creates some amount of accountability. So in thinking through this, very similar questions. Um, 
in terms of plant, what have you done or plan to do in this phase? Are there things that are resonating with y'all where we're like, actually, we also did this other thing? Um, and what might be the purpose of this phase for an organization for yourself? And any other comments that you might have about this particular phase that you want to offer in the chat? All right, so I'm seeing some comments come through in the chat and it's more of a question. So in what ways can you engage and involve parts of the community who are not employed by the organizations, parents, families, outside organizations? This is a question for us, for me with that particular client that was uh, clear from that initial assessment meeting that they wanted the folks that you're talking about, parents, families, folks outside of the organization to be part of that process. And you can encourage that because again, if you're a nonprofit and your focus is people, how are you serving those people beyond what you're delivering to them, especially when you're inviting in someone to offer specialized content? Yeah, I also think of, you know, that depends on the level of communication and the type of communication that you've engaged those community members in already, right? Do you have reciprocal feedback already set up so that they have a way to, to, to respond to you and you have a way to respond to them? Or is that something you actually need to start, right? That you, maybe you need more communication from, uh, with, those, with those different constituencies or stakeholders. Yeah, so I'm seeing a couple of other questions come in. Um, and I also just want to highlight that folks are saying about this particular phase of this life cycle is just um, intentionality around building relationships, prescribing micro learning training to help raise awareness, um, creating curriculum for the year and incorporating that into meetings and discussions, and also thinking about decolonizing curriculum, libraries, classroom structure, and that 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 can just be the beginning. And then there's a the question of what would collaborating with a similar community group look like? <clears throat> would that be a training with a similar organization also in attendance for reflection? So with this particular case study, it was um, a group that shared a similar mission um, and it was their staff, both staff, sets of staff from both organizations were brought together to do a training that I led. And in terms of um, an attendance for reflection, we debriefed and we talked about it afterwards. So they become part of that process. And again, those boundaries can be set up and decided. And those also don't have to be hard boundaries, right? If you're like, oops, we forgot to include partner organizations, you can always go back. I don't want y'all to also think as well that, <clears throat> as Liz mentioned, this is complicated, it's intersectional. Some of y'all might be starting in one phase and have to go to another one. This is just the order that we have found that makes the most sense to us in terms of delivery as consultants in this work. So we, I think we should go forward to the next phase. Right. Um, so watering and maintenance. So continuing to develop and support the efforts, making sure that these little seeds that you've planted can grow and sprout and take root. Um, so doing tra post-assessment trainings, and that's a checking in of uh, what impact are we having? Where are things landing? What are we missing? Um, developing a value statement. So. We've seen who we are. We are starting to get a sense for, of who we want to be, but let's plant those roots. Let's say this is what we value and commit to that as a way to hold um, ourselves accountable. Um, and then that goes to accountability through systems and practices. And I think that's where real transparent communication and relationship building is important, that there's accountability throughout this process. Yeah. And what accountability looks like is going to be dependent on the organization because it depends on who is actually involved. How are you holding yourself accountable if your board of directors aren't involved with the process from the beginning? What happens if um, a different person that uh, should have been there that's a decision maker isn't there? So just know that accountability is, is 
super important. And I think probably one of the hardest things for organizations to actually do and maintain. Um, what we have found in terms of this particular phase with the case study is doing a post survey. So there's a question earlier about reflection. That's what this looks like for us. We did a pre survey. So the other balance of that is to do a post survey and to understand what have we learned from this process. Um, what still needs to be done? Where are the gaps um, in terms of things that have been misunderstood? Has uh, potentially new things developed along the way that weren't actually discussed or brought up at the very beginning or in some of these earlier phase and a post survey can help reveal that. Also, we talked about defining values very early on in one of the beginning phases. So now that you've done all this work, you've had all this training, you've educated yourself, creating a value statement um, that was shared publicly on the website. So it's not just, yay, we did training and that's it. <laughs> it's like, we did training and this is how we plan to implement our learning and embed it into the fabric of the organization by having a value statement that's reflective of that learning and positions organize that particular organization with a path forward. So we have a question about establishing metrics for accountability, um, which I, th I think is a great suggestion, right? What do those and I would ask then what do the metrics look like and they're going to be dependent on the organization. Um, but I think that's where having like a value statement and a and really written down the goals and the specific impact that you want to have um, and the outcomes that you want to have, then you can compare those, you know, those can become your metrics. But I wonder too, for the person who asked this question, um, what, what were you thinking about and what, what might metrics look like for you or your organization or just in general? Is that a question that you want them to answer? <laughs> or yeah, if, you, if, you, okay. if, if you'd like to, because I'm, curi I'm curious. Um, and there's a second question. I do want to say something about the metrics for accountability. I think oftentimes people talk about the good old strategic plan, right? <clears throat> so is this a one-off? Did you just hire some money for a year and be like, yep, 2016, we did it. It's done. It goes on a shelf. Or are you carrying that forward as part of organizational importance? in a way that's that you're art in a system that already exists so accountability doesn't have to mean <clears throat> coming up with something brand new what are the existing metrics that already are happening that you can fold some of this work into i'm seeing if that person added anything in the chat and they haven't so um, if you do we'll come back to that there's another question about have you found that people need help with basic skills of relationship communication working with strong emotions etc is that outside your scope? Do you have thoughts on this, Liz? Yeah, I, I think of that in the planting your seeds phase. So the, the training the, and the workshops that you, that you engage in are not just knowledge and content based, but that are also about practicing together. And so when you offer these, these ideas and concepts, you give people room to, to, to play and, and, and discuss and really um, try to figure out what that means to them um, in, in, in interactive ways. And it's also part of fostering an ideal environment, right? So being able to talk about race in, an, uh, uh, in certain organizations can be really hard, right? Some organizations are like, we don't talk about race. And so even just starting to have that conversation is laying the foundation so that you can bring the, these things out into the open. Um, I All like, right, so yeah. I think we are in the fourth phase. Yeah, we had, uh, when does the post survey occur? Uh, I would do it a couple weeks down the line. I think sometimes it takes a while for, for things to land, but it's also tricky logistically because sometimes you lose folks or interest or people are like, I don't even remember what happened yesterday, especially in pandemic time. So um, you know your audience best, I would say. Yeah. And I think it's also both goes back to style too. For some folks, um, they want to survey throughout and there's different, like survey doesn't have to mean extensive 20 question survey about the entire process each time. It could be what questions are you asking at the end of training? That's a way of getting uh, feedback. Um, how are you checking in with that particular 
organization and client? Are you finding um, that you're only talking to them at the beginning, you're executing, and you're only entering into a conversation with them at the end? That limits then that type of accountability and that kind of check-in that could happen throughout because you're consistently talking to them because you're on retainer and you are available to have those conversations. I want to underscore as well that when I'm talking about availability of consultants, there's a cost for that, right? Because consistently, if you're having what seems like a 10 minute conversation with a client, you're probably imparting a lot of your own expertise, skill, and knowledge, and there's a value add and what that offers to them beyond just the scope of a training or executing some of these other phases, which is why you'll hear me say often about retention. I was on retention with this particular client and it afforded a lot more offerings and opportunities because they saw the value add and just having me be available to have those conversations if you're finding that a training goes left or is really awesome and you want to talk about it and maybe do something because of that and change the scope of the work, that can be a possibility through having that retainer relationship. So I want to underscore that too. There's also a resource that's been put in the chat as well um, about this specific phase and about uh, the conversation around metrics and demands, a specific specific to theater. So please do check out that resource that's been included of we see you white American theater demands. And right. I think that's just a good example for any sector to see clearly laid out demands that you can then compare and, and use as a guide. Yeah, absolutely. So we are in the harvest phase. So go for it, Liz. Reflect and yes. rest. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, so assessing the overall You would think that this would never happen anymore after how many months of Zoom that we would never mute. Okay, um, so assessing the overall evolution of the organization. So this is where all of that data from the first phase of choosing your plant is super helpful to know where we've been and to be really upfront about where we started. Um, and then that you have data-driven outcomes from that. So this is where we are, this is, this is where we were, this is where we are now. Take a moment to celebrate. That's, that's beautifully important, I think, that is not a phase that we ever, we ever really uh, allow ourselves um, to, to really appreciate all of the work and time and energy that has gone in, recognizing that it's not complete, it's never ending, right? But to just take that time to appreciate each other and yourself for the evolution. Um, and then to share, to share back um, your learnings and your outcomes with the broader, with each other and with the broader community. Again, keeping in mind transparent, reciprocal communication throughout each phase and that this is a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to put in the chat now so y'all can begin to think about it. So similar question from previous phases within this harvest phase, what have you done or planned to do in this phase with the client that we're using for this case study? It was a public share and an organization membership meeting on everything that happened um, and to share results and offer final recommendations. So it can be something as simple and direct as that. It could also, for some folks, some folks might just be like, you know what, I just want to report. <clears throat> and that's, that's also a choice and also an option. Um, it could be maybe presenting at a board meeting. Um, it could be whatever it is that best serves uh, the needs of what it is that they want. Um, and in terms of the purpose of this particular phase, you want to reflect. You've done all this work. Ideally, you probably have done work over several months, hopefully, and not weeks. Um, and then reckon with those accomplishments and growth achieved so far. And also be honest of what hasn't been, what hasn't been done, what wasn't able to be completed. Thinking back to that very first meeting that you had, and are there things that were that you thought that you could get to that you didn't because of time or just because the direction of the engagement shifted and taking taking real time for that appreciation and recognition 
If you have surveyed residents or your membership or people, please appreciate them because I guarantee if you ask them to do that again, if you did not appreciate them, they will not give you responses. They have given you an incredible resource in offering their perspective and it's so important to show that gratitude. Also thinking about how you can build that community within and without the organization around change process. So are there specific things thinking back to those similar organizations that you went through training with? Have you reflected with them? That was a question that came up earlier. You don't necessarily need a consultant to reflect with the other, your other peer groups. Have you found ways to do that informally or made it a formal process to continue that reflection and the relationships that you've built so far? When you think about this phase, which can be a hard one too, because it's almost like coming to the end, right? Like you're starting to end that engagement, starting to end that relationship. What have you done or plan to do in this particular phase? And we have one more phase after this. There's a comment that has come through around this phase that for their organization, they provide a DEI upgrade guidelines and ways that uh, the organization will enhance DEI within the organization and how in terms of operation, ways to share with the outside community to broaden our community, right? So it's being vulnerable and being like, hey, we just went through some DEI engagement. Here's what we learned. Here's how we're reflecting. Because again, it's also important to remember that a consultant and a person that you're bringing in, it's an outside person. So how powerful is it to have someone at the top offer a public reflection about that work and about that engagement? Mm -hmm. Alrighty, I think we can go forward to the last phase. Yeah, I think this is the trickiest one, I'll be, I'll be honest, for me to really envision um and this but i i don't i don't separate it from all the other phases right all the other phases are leading up to and this is an indication that this is ongoing work so the reseeding is a, is about sustaining this and um some of this has come down to you know you can put all this effort into it but once the focus shifts away from dei or anti-oppression work which which it never really should, right? It's a, it's a vital part of, it, of every organization because we are human beings and it's a part of our lives. Um, uh, sometimes when the focus shifts, uh, the work is lost, right? So this is about making sure that practices that you have put into pl place are sustainable, are structured, are systemic, um, and uh, are ongoing, that resources have been allocated long-term, not just in this last six months, but for the inevitable future to sustaining these efforts. Maybe it's the hiring of a specific person. Maybe it's just making sure that everybody has a role to play in, in, in some way, um, even if it's not in their job description, put it in their job description, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I realize that the sustain part on this slide is repeated. So I'll just offer that um, with this particular um, case study, and I don't know, Liz, if you want to make the real time edit of this, is that there was a diversity, equity and inclusion committee that was created as part of the work that I did with them. And that committee still exists. It's one of their stronger committees that they have, and it's tied both directly to the board um, and to the organization itself. So the sustainability comes through that accountability that Liz was talking about. If it's not in someone's job description, at least it's in the form of a committee. So it's more than just one person that's able to actually move that work forward. Um, and also consider too, if you're realizing that you're an organization that doesn't have the capacity to include this in somebody's job description, as in they no longer do what they already are tasked to do and not like, okay, on top of what you're already doing, now do DEI, that's not what we're suggesting. That is probably the worst thing you can do because you're gonna burn out that individual. So you have to consider at the end of this, what does that actually look like? Um, because 
you need to have a person because the person that was holding you accountable is leaving unless you retain them and keep them there. Yeah, I'm really curious to know what folks have done or plan to do in this phase. And maybe it's because it feels the most aspirational that <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of examples of this put into practice, right? It's rare to get to this phase. Um, making, making trainings uh, a part of new board or, or onboarding and orientation. Yeah, that's a great specific, thank you for that very specific example, right? And I've seen that in this in academic spaces as well. All incoming fresh, freshmen get this, this training that they all experience together, right? Maybe it's for new staff members. Yeah, so there's some other comments in the chat about this, ensuring that there's funding, right? So we're talking about hiring people, so make sure that you can pay them. Um, thinking about um, uh, thinking about um, how you're going to do the work in the future, um, capacity building in any kind of way, um, having a GEI board committee. Um, and again, these committees are uh, effective as long as they're actionable right like a lot of organizations love to be like oh, we have a committee that's doing dei cool what are you doing what are you doing and how is it tied to the organizational goals the strategic goals of the organization don't have it just be a placeholder so um there's a question on what's oh it just moved for me question on what's the relative value of a highly engaged less motivated subgroup versus a broader but more diluted effect within the entire organization i'm not understanding the latter half of that comparison uh we've got a raised hand can we uh do folks can folks unmute do you want to unmute yourself and um and share it went away. I, uh, you might be talking to me. I, I posed the question in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, I was but I'm not the person that raised their hand. There's somebody else out there who's raised their hand about possibly a different subject. Yeah, it's just a timing thing. So why don't you go first and then we'll have the person that raised their hand unmute. So thank you for that generosity. I, uh, I'm working, uh, I'm part of the leadership for a, a, a a group, an organization which is all uh, self-selected members, a club. Um, and I'm really interested in this space. I've been trying to organize some efforts within this space. I find that there are certain people within my club who are pretty receptive to it and are starting to take action and, and meet with me and, and work on surveys and so forth. I wonder about whether it's, it's more a better use of my time right now to focus on the people who are already pretty engaged or to make sure that everyone is aware and everyone in the in the whole or, whole organization is um, changing just a little bit, you know, or or aware just a little bit. Like, is it is it is it better to focus uh, tightly or to to spread your message and to try and make sure that everybody's aware? Yeah, I don't. I think if folks have, I, I'm sure there are a lot of thoughts about this. I think it really depends on your organization and the capacity that you have, right? I worry that if it's too diluted, um, it won't really have much of an impact, right? That's those like two hour DEI training. It is a great question um, where it's like, okay, we did this box check. Everybody's got some little like, you know, drippings of, of water for their seeds, but, but do they have enough to grow? Sometimes it might be important really to foster th that community of folks who are already really engaged and also to give them the resources that they need to move forward. 
Um, so I don't have an easy answer. I think that that's maybe something that might come out in the climate assessment is like, what are people's overall capacity to do this work? Um, but m my hope would be as you move through the cycle that you're building more energy and capacity and will um, from broader from broader constituencies throughout. I don't know if that helps, but I have I a thought that. on that. Yeah. So for me, when I hear that question, I think about secret secret DEI meetings mm -hmm. when you have a large organization and it's like, oh, I didn't know we had a DEI committee. Oh, yeah, it's been around for like five years. How would anybody know that unless you're publicly talking about it? And why does it need to be small? Because again, throughout this presentation, Liz and I have talked about integration into the entire organization. So even if you have a committee that's small, that might not be open to everybody, that's cool. And how is it tying back to the organizational goals? How are you still continuing to uplift and do things related to DEI outside of that committee? So um, I know that there was a person that raised their hand and there's also two questions in the chat as well that I don't want to lose. So if the, the person- The hand is no longer raised. So if the person that did raise the hand wants to get on, that would be fabulous. We're going to give you that space now and then we're going to go to the two other questions that are in the chat. Okay. We can come back to you. Um, so the first question is, what do we do slash what steps can be taken within an equity, taken when an equity group is formed within an organization, but the requests for services from that equity team are not being met? So I'm curious in this example, how, how, what the role of leadership is in, in this organization is leadership engaged, right? If you don't have leadership engaged, then the resources will not be allocated. And so I think that's a really important reckoning with capacity and with, um, with resources and with will. Um, what do you think, Mary? I think to me, it ref I mean, to be completely blunt, I think it just reflects that uh, it's a band-aid to a larger problem. It's like, hey, we're going to give you a group, but we're not actually going to support you. So to me, it doesn't seem like the organization actually cares about doing the work. They just want to create a placeholder to say that they have a committee that focuses on equity, but the accountability is lost when you aren't able to actually fulfill the request and provide services. That's what I... I feel like happens and that's unfortunate if that is actually happening um, and if there's a possibility to advocate and be direct without because there's risk right there's risk in being direct about hey you created this we're doing work we need the support there's risk of potentially losing your job and speaking out and advocating for that so that's a very real thing that sometimes happens and it's unfortunate to hear that that's what's going on within your organization, but that's how it lands for me. Mm -hmm. There's a second question that I saw, and there might be more. Um, and the board slash staff committee, uh, with that example, organization in the case study created, what are they tasked with specifically? So it's everything from making sure um, when folks are like, hey, we want a diverse board. Cool. What does that look like? <laughs> what are the... What are the metrics of that? What are you looking for? Why are you looking for that? Having those conversations in terms of board recruitment. Also holding the, um, because of how organizational logistics work, being able to uh, hold accountable the executive director and actually doing all of the things that they said that they would do as it relates to DEI. Like that is an, a built in source of accountability to the top because of how nonprofit uh, organizations are just set up. Also thinking too about if you have other things that are happening within the organization, are they meeting the metrics or the recruitment or the populations? Are you reaching the people that you actually want to reach that should be part of that organization and thinking about that part of accountability too? And I think part of that comes down to uh, this question, how can we hold admin accountable? And I think you addressed that to some extent. 
Um, and I think, again, this is where in the early phases of, of choosing your seeds and planting your seeds, you make sure that leadership has an as equal of a role as everybody else, if it's not more so, right? They should be taking point on this. Um, it's perhaps writing it into that job, those job descriptions that this is, no, this is as important as any other factors. Um, if you have a board, if that's how your organization works, um, bringing them on, bringing them into that process. What else? What else, folks? Yeah. So here's what I'm going to offer. What we can offer, Liz, is we've been talking to y'all for a while and we appreciate y'all for listening and being here and being attentive. And thank you so much too for engaging in the chat. We want to give you space to talk to each other um, and we can do that. And then we can also come back and answer some more questions because more things might come up as you hear from different people. So that's something else to think about. So as we're setting up these breakout rooms, if you have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat so Liz and I can be prepared to answer those when you return. Here's what's going to happen in those breakout rooms is you are invited. And again, this is an invitation, right? We recognize that based on the nature of this particular breakout session, y'all are all representing potentially different organizations. Some of you might know each other and know which organizations you represent within your own comfort, we invite you to share where you are on these cycles that we talked about. Where might you want to be by the end of this year? You have the luxury of time to an extent to think about 2021 in this moment for your organization. As you think about where you are and where you want to be, what are the barriers, challenges to closing that gap? And then we can also put these questions in the chat as well. So you have them as you go to the rooms. You're gonna be in groups of about three, about four, and then there might be a couple of groups of five, um, but really honor, honor what you need to in offering what is most comfortable for you and recognizing that if someone has offered something, please offer them something. Don't just let one person talk the entire time because that's not engaging as a group. So you'll have about eight, eight or so minutes, maybe less than that, in breakout rooms to chat with each other. Um, if you have been off video in the main space, we encourage and invite you for those that are able to be on video in the breakout rooms just to create that community. So if we could open up the breakout rooms now to our lovely tech volunteers. That would be fantastic. And we'll see y'all back in a little bit. Bye folks. See you soon. I'm joining our room. Yeah, Mary? Yeah, that sounds good. And there are also just a couple people that are on a sign because they got here a little bit later. So I'm going to move them now. Yeah, so we can all head into our room too. There's some people that are already in there. Hello, welcome back. Welcome back. Bye. That was not enough time for you all. That was just like a scratch the surface discussion. Just want to say I acknowledge that. Yeah. And some folks are trying to squeeze out that last 30 seconds. Yeah. Oh, hello. 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 Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to hear a voice that's not mine or Mary's. <laughs> hello. That was very good. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. You. Good chat. Yeah. Lovely. We'd love to hear some highlights of what came up for you in your breakout rooms. And we are going to invite folks to do that in the chat. Um, so the numbers are still coming. So folks are coming back slowly. We're climbing back up. So from your breakout rooms, as folks are arriving back, what are some highlights that came up for you that you want to share with a group? Keep in mind anonymity and confidentiality. The lessons that you learned, put those in the chat. Um, and anything that you might wanna share, put that in the chat. One other thing that also came up right before this um, is the person, or it's the organization that we were talking about with the case study is actually present in the room. And I want to 
invite them because they offered to share anything about this process because they've gone through it with me a couple years ago. Um, and if you could just keep it brief and maybe focus on the receive part since that seems to be a lot of what people are curious about. So I'm going to invite you to do that now. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Mary. Hi, this is, I'm Dave Bringen. I'm the executive director of Lawrenceville United and we were the case study. So this has been great to, to watch this. Um, but yeah, just, um, yeah, I, I think um, Mary touched on it previously, but you know, um, having a consultant on retainer was really critical because like she said, there were so many issues that came up during that initial process. Things we didn't expect, uh, things going on, other things going on with the organization where it was really instructive to have Mary's time. So I do think making a financial commitment to, and a, and a time commitment to do it, um, and then thinking about, you know, how are you going to sustain this? And for us, like Mary talked about, um, having a committee that, that had had some reps, you know, had formed and had um, actually been meeting and doing work making a commitment to sustain that and charging them with very specific tasks of, of setting some of the like more concrete specific goals for the larger organization and the full board sort of knowing that we're going to task them with you know getting into the nitty gritty of what these goals are going to look like but it'll be the full board's responsibility to carry out these goals once once we receive them. So that, you know, we were talking about that earlier, but like that structure of having a committee, but it being reported back and expected to be reported back and that the board would have the full ownership over executing it. Um, and then we're, you know, continuing to do the education too. Like uh, we're, we're looking to, we, we've uh, put it into our budget for this year to continue to have someone on retainer for this year. So we're continuing to receive like we just talked about. Thanks for that, Dave. Appreciate that offer and uh, insight for sharing to ground it in a real person and not like a fictional organization. So appreciate that share. There have been a couple of questions that have come up. So we're ending the end of our time together. So please do continue to ask those questions. We want to talk about one other thing and then we'll answer the questions with our remaining time. So recognizing that this is a lot, right? It's a lot of content. It's a lot of phases. It's a lot of steps. We wanted to leave or be close to leaving on something, something tangible, right? What is one step that you can take to start the process of creating sustainable, effective, just, and ethical change? Um, it could be something small. It could be something big, um, but just something you can do when you go back to your organization, something you can do today um, to get this process started or to continue and sustain the process. And I hope that we can see folks' responses and feel uplifted and empowered by that, right? It doesn't need to be all at once. It starts one step at a time. So as we're doing this, I also want to uplift a, a couple of comments were about under-resourced uh, organizations. And I feel this deeply because I'm in the arts and it's like, listen, we have the grant money to do the work that we are doing and we serve our communities and that's, that's our capacity. And so I think my question is, you know, what, what do you absolutely need a consultant for and what can you do yourself? What kind of capacity do you have in your organization to do that? Capacity is also about, it's as much about energy uh, emotional and physical as it is about money. So I, I want to be mindful of that too. But also thinking about um, you are each other's resource, right? So the people in this room, can you be a network to hold each other accountable? And maybe it's exchanging information with the folks here today. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of expertise in this room, I imagine, right? And so so maybe it's about putting yourself out there and doing that networking. Um, Mary talked about uh, collaborative organizations sharing training, right? So maybe it's a kind of a collective cooperative model um, that you you bring in when you're when you're thinking of uh, similar organizations and thinking about can we share a consultant? Can we share a training? Um, I think there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. So I just want to take a pause. Thanks for offering some of those reflections from folks coming back. Um, and we'll also highlight some next steps too. Speaking of expertise, 
the summit would love for y'all to share your reflections and expertise. So I'm going to invite the volunteers to put that survey link in the chat. Also, Liz and I would love to have some additional feedback from y'all as well. So we're, we also have our own survey. Fun fact, the summit survey is the same survey that you probably got in session one. And it'll also be the same survey you're gonna get in session three. The survey that you have from Liz and myself is unique to us. So thank you. Please keep those questions going in the chat. Like what questions are you left with? What questions are unanswered for you? And Liz and I can send um, a video out to folks answering some of these questions that we don't get to. So we're not saying like, give us your questions. And you're looking at the time like, it's not possible to answer them. It is. We will follow up with you. Best way to follow up with us is to complete our survey and leave your email address so you can receive that follow up. Other things around keep in touch with us. You see again our post workshop survey. Um, throughout the year, we offer um, support developing a DEI plan. If you're like, yes, please, we need support with this, let us know. Um, we can also offer consulting and training on DEI, coaching for your DEI needs. And we're also talking about putting a cohort together. I think one of the conversations um, that came out in terms of reseeding when we were reflecting, not to continue to do this work in silos, right? It's really important that you know that you're not alone in thinking about these things. So having the power and numbers of other folks from other organizations to talk through this work together. So so that's our contact information um, that's there, um, email addresses, and my website. Mm -hmm. So any questions? I don't think the summit survey has been in there, but if you attended a nine o'clock session, it's the same survey. Uh, it was. I'm just going to copy and paste it again. Also, thank you to Tim Stevens for um, the wonderful resource of the Black Political Empowerment Project's Corporate Equity and Inclusion Roundtable Initiative. Um, some really great resources and contact information there. Thank you. Thank you, Josh and Bonnie, for putting that survey link back in. Yeah. Um, is it thank possible you. to have access to the PowerPoint to review after? Um, we're not going to share our slides directly, but you, there will be the recording and all of the slides will be on that recording. So I'm just gonna scan the chat to see if there are other questions that you're left with that we might've missed that have come up for you. Thank you folks for reflecting as well in the chat because reflection is good, right? We spent a whole little bit of time talking about that. Reflection is part of the process. So appreciate y'all reflecting in those breakout rooms and in the chat for us to know how this session wants for you. Thank you, Dave, for the shout out. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks for the endorsement. Um, we, I feel like we, we put a lot of information on your plates. This is a, this is an offering, right? It's, it's a, it's a way to shift thinking around diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And really, I think the biggest takeaway is that it's ongoing. It's complex. It's a living or breathing organized organism, right? So how can you treat it as such? And we appreciate you all being here because, um, if you're taking this back to your organizations, that means that, that, um, you know, that, that this will start to be implemented, implemented, hopefully, which we appreciate. Yeah. And if you decide that you want to offer the video and the slides and the process of this to your organization, or even in, in your own consulting, we just ask that you credit Liz and myself. Uh, legacy of work can die pretty quickly if you don't offer credit. So in much the same way that we honored the people who advised us on this work, we ask that you give credit uh, when you share out this resource as well. Uh, Sarah, absolutely, absolutely. To think about, I think, uh, to adapt this to any organization, I think a challenge with uh, campuses and, and academia is that, um, especially for students, right, they're shifting. Um, there's there's like a turnover, <laughs> right, as, as folks graduate. And so what does sustainability look like in a student-led organization? Um, what kinds of resources or how do you think about capacity in that setting? Um, but I think it comes down to systems that you put in place, handbooks, manuals, whatever. Um, and I think I want to add too, I meant to say this before, that those systems, how do you keep those systems flexible and adaptive as new folks come in, right? As things happen in the world that change the priorities, right? So that 
your systems are sustainable, but they're not inflexible. Um, that's something I think we, we didn't touch upon too much, but just to add another complicated uh, factor to the mix. Yeah, there's so much that we could add and we appreciate y'all who have stuck around past time. We've stolen like one additional minute of your time from the summit today. So thank you so much for being here. Again, if there are other questions as you're leaving, Liz and I can follow up um, in a video chat about it. So appreciate y'all for being here. Thank you and please do enjoy the rest of the summit.